You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 18 of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today, we are joined by Clive Lewis. Clive is a business psychologist specializing in individual, team, and organizational behavior. He is one of the UK's most sought-after mediators and is the founder and chief executive of Globus Mediation Group. Today, we'll be discussing Clive's new book, Toxic, A Guide to Rebuilding Respect and Tolerance in a Hostile Workplace. Clive, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. So when I was reading your book, I found it to be very original. I hadn't read a book similar to this in, in the business space. I tend to read books specifically on startups when it comes to business, not so much from the HR perspective as that's obviously your background. So I think it'd be good to start off to talk about what are the main features of a toxic environment at work? Yes, yeah, certainly. What I found when I was researching the book uh, was that um, this is a, a really good place to, to start. I wrote the book uh, based on two aspects. One is what the literature says about toxic workplaces. And the second was what my own experience has been, having spent uh, the best part of 15 or 16 years on the front line, going into organizations to try and resolve uh, issues. Um, And my sense was that there were three things um, at play. And I had to balance that off against the literature, which was suggesting that when there's a toxic place, then there is something to look at in terms of the uh, employee and the employee role and their behavior uh, in contributing towards a, a toxic workplace. And the other aspect was the role of uh, the leader. Uh, and I mentioned Maria Wick- Wicker uh, in the book in terms of her description of, of toxic leaders. But my, my sense was something different. And um, I, as a result, uh, introduced what I now refer to in the book as the toxic triad, which is suggesting that the three areas that are at play for workplaces to become toxic are uh, the employee and their responsibility for their behavior and how they interact with others. Uh, the second is the role of the line manager and his or her um, competence in fulfilling their, their role and their ability to do things such as nip things in the bud uh, when problems look as if they are uh, escalating um, and um, withholding from behaviors such as taking credit for the work of their direct reports, uh, for example. Third um, area that I mention is organization systems. And that's because I found that um, disputes might be drawn to a, a close and relationships are getting back on track, but sometimes the, the systems in an organization can prevent that. Um, so that might be a very obvious example is the grievance process, encouraging people to still move towards rights-based processes rather than interest-based processes. Um, For example, not having clear transparency about organization charts, people not being quite sure about the parameters or the remit of their job, and it means that they are treading on the toes of of others. That's what I mean by organization systems. So it's those, those three areas that I refer to as the toxic triad. Which one do you feel like is most prevalent at this moment when it comes to that toxic triad? In your own experiences? They they are all at play. They, in, in my experience, and what the cases that I'm involved in with mm-hmm. organizations at the moment, uh, they're, they're, there's a mix. Sometimes an individual lacks insight about how they are interacting with, with others. Sometimes the organization might be heavily bureaucratic mm. and want, it wants to tick boxes to ensure that it's followed a process. In other ways, it might be that the line manager, perhaps they're a new appointee, and they haven't picked up quickly enough with their brief about how a line, how the role of a line manager should be executed. It's it's a mix. Mm. Hence, hence the triad. So they're all, they're all connected with one one another. One one thing that I found interesting is you mentioned the organisation, and I think that is something that the right conditions or correcting the right or creating the right environment for these sort of facilitated discussions to happen in that open and transparent environment 
how best do you think it is to to go about creating the right environments or the right conditions to to foster those discussions and those non confrontational yeah. discussions? Yes. Well, in, in the book, there's a con- uh, one of the concepts that I touch on is this uh, is the concept of psychological safety, mm. and I refer to the work of Amy Edmondson from Harvard, who um, helpfully introduced us to that term of psychological safety, uh, which essentially is about um, colleagues feeling as if they are able to speak up or speak out without any fear of retribution. And for me, it's right at the top of the list to in- ensure that um, there is an encouragement for cultures being willing to have uh, feedback. If colleagues get a sense that the moment they say something, which is maybe different to the norm, it's slightly out of line, maybe they're slightly ahead of everyone else, if they are in, if they are then put back in their box, as it were, mm. not only will they decline from um, coming forward at another opportunity, um, but also colleagues will see what happens and how you are treated the moment you put your head above the parapet and they'll decide to opt out and say, <laughs> and now I've seen that there's no way that I'm going to suffer the same uh, treatment. When it comes to, to creating those environments, is it more about education or is it more about the employers creating a system? How, how, do, how do leaders go about creating that system? It's, it's um, a, a mix, uh, but um, allowing creativity to flow, allowing ideas to be put on the table, um, treating mistakes as an opportunity for learning rather than blame. All of those things, when they're played out over time, will encourage uh, transparency, will encourage people to want to talk and to put their thoughts Mm -hmm. on the table rather than uh, them closing down because of their fear of how they might be treated. When it comes to the leaders, what, what do you think is one of the obstacles for leaders to not adopt that mindset of open and transparent ways of thinking? Because it seems like from reading the book is a lot of leaders still play the blame game because they want to maintain their status and hierarchy within the organization. How do, how do yeah. leaders have that mindset shift in, in your experience? Yeah. Well, what I think is important for leaders when I, because it's a huge topic, isn't it? Mm. Interestingly, I uh, saw some research last week, a very small sample of just 50 HR directors uh, thinking about a conference that's coming up and they were asked the question about what's keeping them awake at night, what's the, their top priorities that they're thinking about. And um, the top two were, uh, one was le- uh, leadership was number one uh, and inclusion was uh, was number two. Mm-hmm. And on this theme of leadership, um, I, I've done my own, inter- my own um, review of the literature about leadership and there are many, many thousands of books that have been written on leadership. Uh, but when you distill them, I think, there are three areas that you can uh, that you eventually end up with. One is about awareness and a, le- a leader's ability to be aware, self-aware of how they might be coming across with others, how are they interacting with others. The second is one's ability to be able to build and maintain relationships. Number two, mm-hmm. and number three is a willingness for for change, uh, to implement change. So when you put those three areas together for anyone who's in a leadership position listening to this session, if they think about how those three areas play out in their own leadership, I, I think that will help them to be best placed for you know, moving the culture along to the place where it needs to be. And you know, we, we all make mistakes. We all have blind spots from time to time. But if we think about those three areas and perhaps if our own awareness isn't where it should be, being willing, willing to have feedback or to accept feedback from Mm. colleagues about where we might need to change. I I think those are the three areas to be mindful of. Yeah, you said that in the book, that leaders need to be more open to feedback. If they're not open to feedback, especially at the moment, it comes across as them being arrogant or the fact that they sort of that know-it-all title of a leader rather than actually leading their team and leading their Mm. organization. Following on from that, you, uh, you mentioned in the book this quote from Peter Drucker, who's a famous business leadership person, written many, many famous books, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I thought that was a great quote. I haven't actually heard that one before. Yeah. How, how do leaders go about creating an organization, whether they be in a large organization, whether it be like the government or perhaps an entrepreneur, about creating a culture without losing sight of the commercial goals of the business? Well, an- another uh, quote in relation to culture is, a quote, I think that is taken from McKinsey, which is how you would describe culture. And I think it's helpful. I think it's powerful uh, as we think about culture. And it's quite simply that culture is 
the way we do things around here. So for leaders, every interaction, behaviors that are demonstrated, the language that's used, whether that's written or from the chief exec down, as that permeates through leadership, that's what's going to set the tone for culture. Uh, and of course, it's possible to have subcultures or microcultures in various divisions or departments, which will be set by the actions and the behavior of whoever's the head of that department. And that's something to be really wary and, and mindful of. And it's the responsibility of those who are at the C-suite level to ensure that subcultures don't exist. Mm. Organizations, they, they need to be rooted out <laughs> if they do surface. How, how do you do that if it's a large organization, perhaps a multinational organization or, or one that has many divisions and, and departments? By filtering down um, areas such as values, uh, for example, most organizations nowadays will be clear or should be clear, certainly on values and objectives. Uh, so they're set from the top and, there's, and then there's a cascading process. Everyone should go through a process of buy-in for these values. And if there is the right feedback mechanism mm. through one-to-ones and, and so on, at some stage it will surface where there's a misalignment let's say, with the values of where the organization wants to go and how a particular line manager or line managers might be thinking about that in, in relation to, to their own uh, behavior. Mm. That buy-in factor is really important, especially when uh, an individual starts. That's been my experience when I, when I used to work at organizations. So my, my first role was with the civil service on, that, on their grad scheme. And I felt like because the way our scheme was set up, we had a rotational program. So we used to go from one job to another every year. And it was difficult because every single job you started, you have to get buy-in essentially from that new organization, because people think that when you join an organization that big, that the values of each department are the same. Obviously, an overarching value system within the organization, but each department or each role or team you go into has a different, obviously, job spec. And then through the job spec, you have a different buy-in process in order to, to share those values. When it, can, when it comes to large organizations uh, under the capitalist framework, I and mean, in the last... 10, 15 years, we've seen a pushback really to that hard level capitalism. And I know John Mackay, founder of Whole Foods, has, has talked about it in depth about conscious capitalism. Do you feel like that system of capitalism and lack of moral standards, especially, I'm not going to tie all of capitalism because obviously that's that's the wrong thing to do, but the excesses of capitalism has a part to play in, in this toxic environment? Yes, yeah, so I, I think that um, it's a, a really good theme that, that you've surface um, that, that you bring up here. Those who have read the book um, in the chapter on leadership, I write about a chief executive that I had the opportunity to interview while I was writing the book. That's Steve Morales. He's the chief executive of uh, the co-op, which is a huge organization, um, 63,000 employees or colleagues, as he prefers to mm -hmm. Them, rather than employees or staff, revenues of, uh, of, of in excess of £10 billion. But for such a commercial organisation, one of the things that I was struck by, which I write about in the book, was that above everything else, he wanted to talk about the good work that is being done by the co-op, bringing in apprentices in schools, having a number of uh, academies that they are responsible for, uh, having uh, something like 45,000 children going to school in uniforms that have been provided for the, the co-op. Mm. And there is a theme in the book that I refer to in relation to our culture and perhaps what we're talking about now in terms of capitalism, which is the, the good work organizations can do by putting their profits to, to good use. And I also in the book refer to uh, someone who isn't very well known, <laughs> even though his book is sold by the, the millions. I give the example of... Um, what drivers uh, individuals might might have, and I refer to the uh, the research that was led by uh, Freud, and uh, the suggestion that the primary driver for us is is pleasure. Adler is is um, contemporary and referred to uh, power being a main main or major driver uh, for individuals. But um, the third person from what we refer to as the Viennese school of psychotherapy is Frank Frankel, Victor Frankel, uh, a survivor of um, Holocaust. And he refers to uh, us being driven primarily by a sense of meaning. Your question on capitalism fits here for me because doing good and helping others sits easier 
uh, for me, uh, particularly when you look at the research that says over a certain level of salary, £60,000 or there, out, there is no link between salary and happiness. Um, giving the opportunity for people to be able to contribute in that way and do do good, um, I think is what organisations should be considering. Definitely. I love that bit in the book where you start talking about Viktor Frankl. I, I, I recommend Man's Search for Meaning to anyone who's uh, <laughs> who's struggling because it definitely yeah. gives it gives some perspective. I found that as well. His book and also God. Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. I think both of those, both of us are mm. incredibly powerful. And I, I like finding people who have read all three, Freud, Jung, and Adler. I'm uh, sorry, so, yeah, Freud, Jung, Adler, and uh, Frankel, because, Frankel, yeah, because you, uh, you definitely get some perspective on all three of them and all their individual flaws, let's just call it that, especially Freud. <laughs> anyway, when it comes to the experiences of, let's say, uh, someone experiencing bullying, for instance, in, in an environment, one of, the, one of the stats that I took from the book uh, with my experiences in public sector was that 21% of public spe- uh, public sector employees experience bullying compared to 14%. Why do you think that is? Because I would have presumed that was the other way around. Like when I was there, I didn't really see that much of it. Why do you think that's the case? Because I would have thought, or many people might think it's the other way around. Yes, I don't know that there is a clear answer um, on that. I mean, I can give you my view, but before I do that, the, the impact of bullying can be huge. Um, just last week, I was speaking to um, a, a client uh, doing some work for a large organization, and they asked whether I, I could um, intervene in a situation that was um, taking place. And I was speaking to a senior manager who described being bullied by her line manager. And um, as she was um, giving her story, uh, a number of things um, struck me. One was that her best night for sleep is Friday. And that's because she's not going to work on Saturday. Um, And then every other night she has uh, broken sleep. Mm. The second thing that stuck out in my mind was a condition she described. She had a skin rash um, break out and it broke out on her hand. And then over time started to spread to other areas of her body. She had no idea what this was. She made an appointment to go and see her GP and as she did that, uh, the GP was doing what GPs do, which is trying to diagnose why this condition had come about. And in doing so, uh, her GP was asking a range of questions about her life and lifestyle. Uh, she asked a number in the process towards the end of asking questions. She said she, she asked the, the, the question that um, uh, got the answer that she was looking for. She simply said, um, and tell me how's work. And at that moment, the person I was spoke, speaking to said that she, she broke down and um, found it difficult to speak to her GP about what was going on at work because she was being bullied and having to suffer some quite difficult uh, treatment. So the impact is really quite, quite immense. Mm. Whether the research led by the CIPD indicated that there's less in the private sector than there is in the um, public sector. Because there's less ability in the in the public sector to be able to um, devote resources, financial resources. Often in the um, private sector, if there's a, a problem or a difficulty with a, a colleague, it's far easier for that conversation, a conversation to take place about this person leaving um, because there isn't a fit with the, the values or the culture. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, um, but often I, I, my experience is that um, a, a payment to leave might be put on the table. It's, it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's far more difficult to do that in the public sector. Mm. So you might find that the behaviours continue because there's a lack of room and uh, a lack of flexibility to be able to do anything about it. Uh, you also find, I would say, in the, in the public sector that there are higher levels of hierarchy. Think about agenda for change in the NHS, for example. 17 or so different management uh, levels. Sometimes uh, there's a very little gap. There's very little gaps between each role and each level. And that can uh, often exacerbate issues of feeling bullied. Do you find that in organisations, that organisations that have a higher levels or, or more levels of hierarchy rather than a meritocracy actually experience higher levels of bullying? Uh, well, my experience is that... Um, uh, 
there tends to be, and this is um, also born out, in, born out in the research, there tends to be higher levels of bullying in public sector organisations than there is in private sector. Just going from my experience of my own caseload, mm. is that's, that's certainly played out. But do, is it related to just like, for instance, if, if you were to compare a private sector organisation that had more levels to another organisation that had less levels, would the one with more levels of hierarchy experience more bullying? Is it like observational rather than yes. any specific research? Yes, I, I, I think so. And I'm comparing public with private because typically there would be le- higher le- more levels of hierarchy in public sector organisations than there is in. Mm. in and um, I, so I think that plays out based on my experience. When it comes, I liked in the book that you talked about the power of forgiveness. And I think forgiveness is something that I think more people need to employ, especially in, in these days of, mm-hmm. of what's, what's happening in, in the environment. So I think that people are very quick to judge, especially in the working world, um, and yet very slow to forgive. How do people go about forgiving each other? What are effective mechanisms specifically in the workplace that organizations and, and leaders can implement in order to encourage yeah. and foster an environment for forgiveness to take place? Mm-hmm. Is it the individual's mm-hmm. responsibility or is it the organizations? Well, it's a bit of both, but it, it has to lead and begin with the, with the individual. Mm. Um, I think, you know, this, when I wrote about forgiveness um, <laughs> in the book, one of the things I, I wrote was that don't really talk about this in relation to work. It's a little too deep. You can talk about it in relation to other, <laughs> but you don't talk about forgiveness uh, in the workplace. <laughs> but I found that sometimes uh, some of the problems that I'm called in to try and address, um, situations have gone back for years and there's lots of hurt and lots of unforgiveness. And over time, it then it then um, builds up. Um, I, I might I recall one of the stories that I tell in the book of a senior manager in the health sector who had moved from a local authority um, to the uh, health sector, having been made redundant. Uh, austerity measures had kicked in, and um, she recounted a story of the chief executive giving an announcement about redundancies. Um, when I was with her running a training course on difficult conversations, this was three or four years on from that announcement. And what I was struck by, as along with others who were on the, the course, was her story um, about the chief executive giving that announcement and that she would never forgive him. She will hold it against him. And one day she will have her revenge. I was, I was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do in that situation? <laughs> you can say, can you? <laughs> Because the, the, the training course was at the part where we were talking about um, colleagues um, and delegates imagining a conversation that they would have that they've been putting off. And that's what she uh, referred to. Um, mm. I refer into the, in the book of a couple of my own experiences, um, trying to be blocked for a promotion, for example, many mm. years ago when I was in retail and also being um, the subject of race um, abuse. Uh, and thinking about those um, examples, I talk about the, the work of the Forgiveness uh, Project, which was an organization that I'd never heard of before, but it just happened that I was able to go to one of their lecturers while I was writing the, the manuscript. And I was frankly blown away by what I saw and heard, which is a, two um, people on stage after the lecture, Joan and Jacob. And um, the story that they played out was a story where um, Jacob had killed Joan's son, mm. it was called James, um, in Nottingham one evening. He heard that there was an altercation going on, he, so he took himself to the pub where this was playing out, and without listening to what was happening, he thought the best course of action would be to strike James's head with his fist. And when he did that, James fell, hit his head, and he never recovered. Eventually... Um, Jacob was sent to prison, and during that time, uh, he was surprised that um, James's mother wanted to reach out to have a conversation with him, find out why he had done what he'd done, and eventually um, to indicate to him that she wanted to forgive him. Mm. We've heard a pin drop amongst an audience of uh, two or three hundred people when she, um, this story was being recounted, because for most of us, that would be really that would stretch us that would be really difficult so 
in the book, I give that as a, an example um, of how forgiveness might play out and encourage readers to think about where in their own scenario in the workplace, they may have unforgiveness about a colleague mm-hmm. that's stretching on for years and years. And might it be possible for them to think about how they could uh, forgive? Um, one of the quotes I give in the book is that unforgiveness is like drinking a bottle of poison and expecting the other person to die. It's only affecting, yeah. sometimes they, they would have no idea actually that you're carrying this unforgiveness uh, with them. And of course, there's also increasing amounts of science about how we can be affected by our health if we're carrying unforgiveness and previous hurts. Um, it's best, not always easy, but it's best where possible to try and let that go and move on. Before resentment kicks in, because I feel like resentment's yes. the, the worst one. When it yes, yes, it is. In, in your role as a mediator, because that's your that's your function and that's what your your yeah. organization uh, that you're CEO of called Globus. Yeah. Is most of your is most of your work and and the work that you do with clients is it regarding those situations where it's uh, an employee employer resentment and and the way that they've been treated? Is it mostly bullying? Where, where where's mm. most of your work towards? Yeah, there's a there's a whole mix uh, a whole mix of um, scenarios. Um, Mostly it's because of a breakdown of a misunderstanding. And in the process of mediation, we start off by uh, encouraging what we call information exchange. And that's where um, I'll get people into a room, either a physical room or more likely today, it's going to be a room via technology, Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And uh, I then invite them to talk to each other and articulate what's been going on for them why the mediation session has been called and why and what a good outcome would look like. And sometimes that's a conversation that they should have had years ago. Mm. And I remember very early on in my career, um, a discussion between two women in the health sector. Um, usually a mediation, mediation session takes a whole day. That's how long we schedule for it. But in this case, um, it took 30 minutes And the reason it took 30 minutes was because in that information exchange at the start of the process where I encouraged one to talk to the other first before the other responded, Mm. it's clear that she said something that her colleague had never heard before and didn't understand. And what she realized was that she was that she'd got the wrong end of the stick. And months later, (laughs) after standoff, after sickness and absence away from the workplace, in 30 minutes, they were able to get their um, dispute put behind them. Mm. And she said something which was critical when she learned this information that she didn't know before. She said, I'm so sorry. Mm. That was needed. It, it brought uh, the dispute to, to an end. And they talked about you know, what the learning was and so on and, and so forth. It probably was an easy day to you compared to others. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, unlike a case um, that I had just this weekend, I mean, we're, we're speaking on Monday and then um, um, Saturday, and usually um, I um, had a, a case to, to mediate, which was a, a business dispute. Um, however, one party was in London, two parties were here in London, and uh, the other party was in um, Hawaii, so we couldn't start until five o'clock our time, and we didn't finish until three o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, wow! I was rather tired after that. I can imagine. You said that earlier on that the power of self awareness is is very important when it comes to leadership. And one of the main ways to test self awareness is the Myers Briggs test because it gives a good indication to the top five person- personality traits or, or the, the five biggest personality traits. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was where is the balance between knowing your strengths and, and knowing what your traits are and actually boxing yourself in and saying to yourself, I am this and I'm not going to change because it's my personality type. Because I've come across people who have said, I'm this type of person and that means I'm not going to do that because it doesn't fit in my personality. Yeah, type. Yeah. Have, you see, have you seen that in practice? Uh, yes, I, I have. I mean, the area of um, personality and using tools to help us understand personality is, is just fascinating. And, and it's huge, um, of course. Um, one of the uh, things for leadership or developing leaders now is all about helping them to understand themselves a, a little bit better. Um, but there's a, a mix of things. There isn't um, a silver bullet, as I would describe it, that um, 
uh, ensures that all boxes are, are ticked. And I think organizations would do best by having a number of resources available uh, to help uh, people. Um, the, I, I mentioned Myers-Briggs, as, as you know, in the, um, in the book and refer to the 16 types and how we might try and fit neatly into one of those 16 um, types. Mm. I also um, mentioned that there are a couple of other tools um, such as Luminous Spark, I, I've, I've mentioned, but Myers Briggs um, only picks upon the four first four areas of personality. Um, so um, uh, that's openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness. There's a fifth aspect, uh, which is neuroticism, mm. about um, emotional resilience, emotional uh, skills, and insight. And that's picked up by different tools. And I mentioned one of them. Um, in, in the book um, about that. Um, so we're learning more and more uh, based on research um, about how we are with a, from a personality point of view, but irrespective of all the tools that we might use and get access to, which can be really enlightening, um, I would encourage all listeners to utilize these tools. Um, of course, um, we have to accept what they say. I often, I do a lot of coaching and um, I often, when I'm talking about someone's report, before I go into the detail, I often, as part of the context setting, say, let's remember the report is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes there might be uh, information in black and white on the report that's very difficult to read. It's areas that we want, we don't want to deal with or address. Exactly. But these tools are well-researched and they are exceptional so it, it's it's for us to accept the information accept the learning and then think about what we might do with that so we might decide that perhaps an area we thought we might work in maybe that's not for us perhaps um, we should be focusing on a, another area or it might be thinking about how we can adapt so for example um, on the introvert extrovert spectrum I, I score higher on the uh, introvert um, spectrum and that's been interesting for me because um, I've sat on and continue to sit on a number of boards, um, particularly as a non-executive director. And the, the research indicates that um, boards usually um, have more extroverted people on them. So for me as a, a, an introvert, I've had to think quite hard about my contribution um, at a board level, not being, um, you know, not stepping back, but making sure that my contribution is heard. And other introverts who might be listening to, mm. uh, to this session might recognize what it is that I'm talking about. So I've had to take my own responsibility to develop in areas that I'm now aware of because some of the tools that I've, I've drawn on. Where do you think the dichotomy is between, or, or what's been your experience in seeing people's reaction to their test scores? Because when I did mine, I was like, I thought to myself, yes, go right on that one. But I, I, on most of it, I was th I thought to myself, you convince yourself that you're not that, even though you know you are. Do you find yourself most people don't actually know who they actually are, but when they see the results, they can think about their their situations and and the decisions that they made that fit the test. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Some people are very open and they're open immediately. Others aren't and they're more reserved or closed down. Some um, might even ask for it to be rerun or <laughs> validity mm -hmm. really do not like what they what they what they see um which is unfortunate um however they may accept it over time once they've had some time to think it through once they've done the test three times it becomes back to the same score <laughs> they're like oh, i can't ask for a fourth time because it's going to say the same thing <laughs> yeah i think that sometimes um, it's said that feedback is a gift and Sometimes in the workplace, it's, a, it's unfortunate that we may go through uh, a good number of our years um, it, as, in terms of our career, but not have that gift given to us in terms of feedback because people are nervous, mm. concerned about what it might mean if they, if they give us that feedback. And for some of us, it means that we spend some time in our careers with huge and significant blind spots not realizing the damage that it might be doing to ourselves or our reputation. Mm. Is that more the organizations that you work for not giving you feedback or is that you not being open to it? Or is it a bit of both? It could be a, a bit of both. Yeah. It's more 
learning, I think, if it's the latter. So. Mm, definitely. I mean, I've been in organizations where there hasn't been a, a mechanism for effective feedback. And if there was, it was more of a sort of a, a tick box exercise just to make yeah. sure that they've done the, the, uh, done the thing that they need to do by their policies rather than something to give effective yes. feedback. Yes. Is that been your experience as well? Yes, yes sometimes it, ha it, ha it, yeah, it has been, which is unfortunate. That is unfortunate because I remember when I was doing my grad scheme, I, I kind of thought that it was there to help us grow and develop. But then I realized that quickly, that I realized that it was just there as a, as a way to make sure that they were just keeping us there so that they can apply for another grad the next year, um, which was yeah. which was quick to quick to realize, which was a shame. But um, mm. such is such is the way it is. Uh, one question I wanted to ask you is, a, is quite a simple one, but I thought it would be good to shed some light in your experience. What do you think the characteristics are of a good employee? So I, I do break this down in the in the book. In the book, when I'm referring to the toxic triad, um, I give a couple of thoughts and ideas about what a, a good employee. Uh, might look like and some of the examples I give include uh, things such as um, being polite and uh, well-mannered. Um, I should say however you know that the, the foundation um, must begin with someone who's competent um, at their role. There's no point being polite and well-mannered if you, if you can't do your job. Mm. <laughs> so step back a bit there and say let's start with someone being competent at their job uh, and if they aren't being open to feedback about where they might need to develop and um, and improve um, so someone who does take pride in achieving their objectives uh, perhaps someone who demonstrates uh, curiosity when they've been let down by others rather than seeking um, uh, revenge uh, someone who's courteous um, and respectful in uh, written or oral uh, communication um, someone who perhaps regularly adds value by adding discretionary effort. So this is going the extra mile. It's going above and beyond, even when you're not asked uh, to, to do that. That's for a, for a line manager, that it's difficult to replace that when you go above and beyond um, their role. Mm. And someone in the team who, rem who remains um, optimistic um, and keeps a solution-focused mindset rather than is being beset by uh, negative uh, negativity. Uh, someone who listens and understands before um, responding, and maybe someone who congratulates co other colleagues when they've done well rather than thinking uh, or being envious of that. I mean, there are many more examples that I can give, but those are some of the examples I chart in the book about what a uh, maybe a non-toxic or a good employee might look like mm. i feel like the one of being a good team player is one that is uh, i think underlooked because i think when you when i started my grad scheme it was very much how can we progress as quickly as possible but then i quickly realized it's not so much about you progressing it's about you making your line manager's job easier because <laughs> if you make yeah. a line manager's job easier it, it sort yeah. of helps you progress yes so i think it's more about being a being a good, being a good team that. player Yes, um, which, is, uh, which is unfortunately not taught enough. How, how, how do you think? How do you think that's that could be taught more? Because my my experience is is um um I grew up playing a lot of sport like team sports, and I think that's really important in understanding how team dynamics work. But then, when I went into an organization, I realized that not a lot of people had that same experience I did. How would you go about understanding team dynamics for perhaps an individual or in your mediation? as someone who hasn't had that experience? Mm, mm. I, th I uh, think that there's a, a mix of things. So at a very basic level, a line manager having and scheduling regular team catch-ups. So for me, for, for the team that I lead, every Monday morning at 9.30, we're together as a team talking about what happened uh, last week and um, what the focus points are for this week. And then what are we trying to do in the longer term? Uh, and everyone in the team has a chance to have a say rather than uh, the conversation being um, limited to, to a few people. So I think that uh, can be helpful. And each colleague having an, un an understanding of what everyone else is working on uh, is also um, ideal. We've already talked about the tools that can be used, and there's one or two tools that can help not just outline what an individual portrait or picture might look like, but you can also now 
uh, use tools where you can see how your portrait is as part of the team. So you can see where colleagues might differ with how you might be thinking, um, uh, for example. Um, and probably the, the um, team sharing of objectives is, is the third thing that I would touch on that everyone can see that uh, we're all working towards the same uh, objectives. I mean, it's extreme. Um, the example that I give in the book about um, the enterprise rent a car and how they reward their colleagues, which is based on profit um, rather than paying um, high uh, base salaries. Um, there aren't many examples like that. And what that does is it gives um, one central focus for teams. That's, but it's, the reason I mentioned it in the book is because I think it's the best example that I've seen of how you might bring teams together um, to, walk, to work towards the same initiatives. Mm. I liked as well that you mentioned the fact that they base, it might be an enterprise or it might be another organization, so apologies if, it, if it's not, is the fact of the customer satisfaction or the yeah. uh, customer service ratings. That's right. Um, yes. that as a model for 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 basing profits or or bonuses whatever it is has that been your experience as well through research and observationally as a metric it's an exceptional one to have because you know customer is king customer you you, you want a repeat um in business so having a focus on the customer uh, i think is without a doubt it's the ideal mm. yeah i did like that example rather than a higher base salary you can uh, yes. give them incentives, financial incentives through profit. I think it's never, never a bad thing, is it? It yeah. definitely encourages your employees to go above mm-hmm. and beyond. Lastly, one of the things we've touched on it slightly, but the the idea of building culture at the moment, given our work from home policies. And last week, the the head of Goldman Sachs, David Solomon, came out and said that having everyone working from home was affecting negatively impacting their junior employees because they couldn't understand the company culture. How do you feel like, do you feel like that's a a negative factor at the moment, especially for people starting out in organizations and perhaps it's fostering toxic environments. The fact that they aren't able to uh, develop themselves and encompass themselves in company culture. Yes. I I agree with him to to a point. Um, My, sense from discussions I'm having with, uh, with a whole range of organizations is that um, it's very unlikely that we will go back to how the world of work was before the pandemic. Uh, what it's done is, is it, it, it has forced a number of things. So our embracing technology quickly, for example, it would never have happened at this speed and pace without the um, pandemic. There is a um, however, um, which is that even though we to um, remain engaged with colleagues by using technology, uh, it's very difficult to replace the interaction, the physical interaction that there is in the workplace, the conversations that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, at the water cooler Mm. uh, uh, while you're in in the canteen, while you're getting something to, to eat. Those kind of conversations add lots of value. They help to build relationships so that's where I would agree with the comment from Mr. Solomon of last week. Um, I think that there needs to be a balance, though. Um, I think now we've experienced what we've experienced, some uh, halfway house where colleagues aren't going to have to go back nine to five, five days a week. Um, it can be done on a um, slightly um, different basis. Maybe that's two or three days a week, but certainly um, the engagement that you get from the physical interaction in the workplace, it's very difficult to replace that. Mm. Lastly, actually, there was, there was one point that you made earlier in regards to sleep. And I think that is critical. I think a lot of people, uh, if yeah. you look why we sleep by Matthew Walker, you'll yeah. know the, the detrimental effects that a, a lack of sleep can have, not only on your yeah. mental health, but also your, your physical health as well, and onset Alzheimer's and, and other such conditions. How... Can organizations, do you encourage organizations through your culture, through your, through your coaching and through your mediation to really focus on the health and well-being side of it? Yes, and, and mo- that's on the radar for most organizations nowadays, nowadays, I would say, um, uh, to focus on health and well-being. Um, but again, there are two sides to this because an organization can only go so far. Uh, we, we've unfortunately, unfortunately had some cases recently where we've been supporting workers on the front line. We have a team of clinical psychologists, Mm. some ICU units where 
there have been some quite some shocking stories, including one or two colleagues who have wanted to um, commit suicide, and they've had yeah. attempts. And one of the things that's uh, come out for me is that actually the organisation have put a number of mechanisms in place to support. Um, but unfortunately, as we've seen in the pandemic, um, we all have personal lives for which the organisation can do nothing about. Sure. As things play out in the home, family, friends, uh, that the organisation is powerless to do things about, but we as individuals can do something um, about it. And it probably brings us back to what we were talking about earlier on in the discussion about um, individual responsibility where we are at and things that we might be um, experiencing mm. you're right the evidence on sleep is, is, is shocking uh, lowering life expectancy um, uh, obesity or increasing levels of obesity if you're not getting the right amount of sleep mm. and seeing it the reason why i included in the book in the in the context setting section a little bit on sleep is because we're seeing more and more sleep difficulties because of um, poor relationships in the workplace mm. Also technology. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of technology and I love social media. <laughs> That's just me. Yeah. But I think yeah. there is a definite relationship or an education. And this is why I think education is so key on yeah. different topics. And books are a great way to do that, obviously. Yeah. Uh, your books is a great way to do that. Uh, <laughs> before we end, uh, it would be good to, to get a bit of an insight, perhaps onto three, perhaps five books that, that really influenced you to 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 pursue your career or perhaps ones that you just enjoy sharing with your friends and family it'd be good to share perhaps three three to five books perhaps that that influenced you uh and, and had a a big impact on you uh well the, the, the book that comes to my mind first is a book that i read a couple of years ago maybe three years ago it's um, um outliers by malcolm gladwell um and I'll, I'll think of other books as i'm talking about this one but for me that was exceptional because of mm -hmm. his ability as a writer to be able to um, break down social science and help us understand through data and metrics and statistics how or why things happen as, as they do. So um, my number one recommendation, um, I think, would be um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, uh, probably a second of his uh, books, actually, if I stick with him. He, he is my favourite author. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'll give a second and then I'll give a third example. Um, is uh, he's written a book called David and Goliath. Yes. And that book is all about the underdog uh, and how it is possible sometimes for you to stand up against giants and still be successful based on your own skills and experience. Um, a third book that comes to mind is the book written by Susan Cain. She wrote a book called Quiet mm. five years ago, 2014, 15. Um, and that for me, I, earlier in our discussion Orn, I mentioned that I'm uh, an introverted, more introverted than extroverted. Her book resonated with me because it's a book about uh, introverts and introversion. And uh, again, what came out for me uh, in her book is that um, it's important that you are yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. Uh, take the, the, the strengths that you've been given, that you've been born with. Um, it was often said that introversion is more of, is seen as a weakness or can be seen as a weakness compared to extroversion. Um, but we're seeing increasingly through what the research is telling us that that's not the case, mm. particularly in terms of leaders. We're seeing that there are some highly effective leaders, and I mentioned some of them in the book, mm. who are um, uh, very capable leaders, and despite... <laughs> Being, being introverts. So the, those are the first three books that come to my mind about books that have really had quite a, an impact. Mm. That's a great selection. Susan Quart, uh, Susan Cain's book has uh, it's been on my list for quite some time now. A lot of people have been recommending it to me. So perhaps yes. I need to push it further up the list. Yes. Thank yes. you for sharing those three, Clive. And I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today uh, to discuss your book, Toxic, A Guide to Rebuilding Respect and Tolerance in the Hostile Workplace. Clive, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today. 
for readers by readers.